Welcome to Archaeoed, a podcast about the civilizations of the ancient Americas. You know, the ones that Western history books spend about a page discussing. I'm your host, Dr. Ed Barnhart. I've been an archaeologist, an explorer, and a seeker of esoteric knowledge all around the Americas for over 30 years now. This podcast is just me, freed from the lecture podium and talking like we're just having a beer together. Sometimes I'll tell stories of my adventures. Other times I'll share what I've learned about the various cultures that were here before Columbus. Basically, it'll be anything I feel like talking about, because this is my podcast, Beholden the No One. I'm just having fun with it. I hope you do too. So without further ado, kick back, relax, and let's get started. Season 4, Episode 1, Dr. Jones, I presume? It's me, Ed, back for Season 4 and happy to be here. I thought I'd kick off this season with a fun topic, namely the difference between fictional and real archaeology. People compare me to Indiana Jones all the time. Just the other day, I was meeting a new neighbor And when I told him that I'm an archaeologist, he immediately replied, Ah, Dr. Jones, in the bad German accent and all. Am I like Indiana Jones? No. It's just that he's most people's point of reference for who an archaeologist is. Most people don't know any archaeologists. Now, I've already admitted on numerous occasions that Indiana Jones inspired 13-year-old Ed to become an archaeologist. I'm not immune to his charms. And I also acknowledge the time gap. Jones is from the 1930s, and archaeology has changed a lot since then. Back then, archaeology was done by treasure hunters or gentlemen scholars who referred to themselves as antiquarians. Professional archaeology, led through government departments or universities, had barely begun in the 1930s. Before that, most expeditions that we know about were funded by governments or corporations, and archaeology was a side gig or in some cases just a front for what was really going on. Ever notice how Indiana Jones is often secretly commissioned by the U.S. government? His compensation is never discussed, but clearly he's being paid by the government. So this is myth number one. Archaeologists are often also government intelligence officers. Those jobs are covert, so who knows who's secretly working for the government today. But this actually did happen in the past, a lot. Stevens and Catherwood did their famous expeditions through the Maya ruins in the 1840s, but Stevens was simultaneously the ambassador for the U.S. to Central America. His unofficial mission was to assess which of the regional dictators the U.S. should back as Central America's new president. During World War I, Sylvanus Morley surveyed over 2,000 miles of the Central American coastline. Yes, he was doing archaeology, but he was also scanning for German submarines as a spy for the U.S. government. Michael Coe was also a covert U.S. intelligence officer. Once at a dinner party in Pennsylvania, I was sat next to Coe and I asked him, I said, Mike, there are rumors that you were a spy. Is that true? And he replied, duh, Ed, everybody knows that. And then he proceeded to tell me a few stories of how, in the 1970s, he and Russian spies would recognize each other poking around communist bookstores in Merida. Now, as I said, I'm not sure if this is still happening. If it is, then I'm offended that the CIA has never tried to enlist me. Or have they? If they did, you'll probably never know. That's how spies roll. That brings me to myth number two. Archaeologists get rich from the treasures they find. Sadly, no. At least not anymore. Jones lives very comfortably, in a nice home and a big office at his university. The assumption is that he's finding treasures and selling them to the government and museums, or at least being handsomely paid to procure them. But that's illegal today. 
You can't hunt for artifacts to sell. That's called looting. But for this one, there is some historical truth here. In the late 1800s, those gentlemen treasure hunters who called themselves antiquarians sold artifacts to museums all the time, and wealthy collectors would pay peasants to bring them artifacts. For example, the amazing collection of Peruvian pottery in Lima's Larco Hoyle Museum was mostly collected by Rafael Larco in the 1930s. He owned sugarcane plantations, and he'd pay his farm workers a few centavos for every intact pot they brought him. Today, that collection is over 30,000 ceramic pieces, all from now unknown contexts. Then there's Max Ule, also in Peru in the 1930s. He would sell artifacts to museums in Europe as the primary way he funded his expeditions. That was just normal business back then. The same kind of thing happened in the U.S. During the Depression, the University of Texas archaeologists paid $1 per Caddo pot to struggling East Texas farmers. Hundreds of pots were brought in, and unfortunately that likely represented dozens of destroyed archaeological sites. Perhaps the worst example was Spiro Mounds in Oklahoma, a huge Mississippian site there. A mining company got legal permits to dig its largest pyramid and found thousands of artifacts. The Smithsonian showed up, not to stop them, but to catalog and buy the best of them. Thank goodness that doesn't happen anymore. Archaeologists don't make a dime off what they find. In fact, most archaeologists I know are just barely scraping by. As a group, we are generally broke. Any archaeologist that is rich started that way through family inheritance and got into archaeology kind of like the days of old as a gentleman scholar. So, moving on to myth number three. Archaeologists are handsome, swashbuckling adventurers. Nope. Most archaeologists are socially awkward nerds these days. Many spend most of their careers in the lab with almost no fieldwork experience whatsoever. In fact, many archaeologists hold open disdain for Indiana Jones, his charm and his swagger. He represents a negative, irresponsible stereotype. I myself was denied entry into University of Texas grad school at first because the reviewers of my application said that my essay sounded like I wanted to be Indiana Jones. Can I sue for definition of character? But to be fair, not all archaeologists are wimpy nerds. There are a few out there that I consider true explorers. Ivan Sprock is one such. He spent the last two decades of his life in the jungles of southern Yucatan, and to date he's found over a dozen lost Maya cities. Not little villages. Cities with pyramids, palaces, ball courts, and still-standing carved stela. Another example is Anna Roosevelt, the granddaughter of Teddy Roosevelt. She spent her life in the Amazon, proving ancient civilizations existed there and finding 9,000-year-old ceramics in treacherous caves. I aspire to be on their level, but really, I'm not there yet. So, moving on to myth number four, archaeologists are roughnecks. Indy is always punching Nazis, fighting his way out of bars, and getting in gunfights. Does that happen? Well, uh... Not often. I've seen a few fights in the field, but usually it's drunks fighting over women. Nothing noble like taking a stand against fascism. And we're never armed. Believe it or not, other countries frown on foreign archaeologists walking around with guns. Now, there was a time in Palenque's jungle where a guy held a gun to my head. But he wanted money. He wasn't looking for the artifacts I was finding. I gave him the 900 pesos in my pocket, and he gave me back 50, saying, para su paciencia, which means, for your patience. I thought, but did not say out loud, ah, this was nice. We should do it again sometime. But joking aside, does that make me a roughneck? No. More like a lucky idiot. 
How about all that drinking that Indiana Jones does? Well, okay. That one is a true characterization. Most archaeologists I know are hardcore drinkers, especially in the field. Those that live to old age, a lot of those guys are in AA now. All right, this is a good moment for my first commercial break. When I return, we'll compare Jones's fieldwork practices to the reality of how things actually go today. The Ancient Maya Calendar. I'm fascinated by it, and though I've been studying it for decades, I still learn new things about it all the time. I call it ancient, but I and literally millions of modern Maya people are still tracking it into modern time. Towards that end, I've created two products to help people better understand it. My annual Maya wall calendar and an iPhone app called simply Maya Calendar. Through these tools, you can figure out today's date, or tomorrow's, or a Maya date thousands of years in the past. The app will even calculate your Maya birthday and tell you about your personality traits and destiny according to modern Maya daykeeper priests. The Maya calendar app is available through iTunes, but both it and my annual Maya wall calendar are available through my website, mayan-calendar.com. That's mayan with an n-calendar.com. Check it out. And I'm back. Okay, let's switch gears and go from who archaeologists are to what archaeologists do. Myth number five. Archaeologists hunt for specific artifacts or treasures. Jones is always looking for specific objects. The Ark, the Stones, the Grail, Coronado's Cross, and embarrassingly, Crystal Skulls. Is that reality? Nope. Not now, and not in the past. Real archaeology is always about understanding past life ways through excavations in places where we have no clear expectations of what we'll find. We love finding treasures, but we don't start with hunting for them. Most treasures we do find are in tombs, and intentionally looking for them is grave robbing. Of course, that's one of Dr. Jones's favorite things to do. Myth number six. Archaeologists are always racing each other and criminals to the artifacts. That would be fun, but no. At least not usually. Frankly, even when we do find really cool stuff, almost nobody cares. Now, there is the funny story of how the English explorers team of Walker and Caddy raced ahead of Stevens and Catherwood to be the first to Palenque. But did anyone care? Have you even heard of Walker and Caddy? For that matter, I bet half of you listening haven't even heard of Stevens and Catherwood either. Thinking about it, I guess I was in a race to the treasure thing once. It was in the tunnels under Copan in the 1990s. Multiple projects were digging tunnels into the Acropolis. Honduran archaeologist Ricardo Agurcia was digging down from Temple 16. Hieroglyphs on the surface said it was a temple dedicated to Copan's first king, so it was likely that his tomb was somewhere inside. My boss, David Sadat, did some calculations and decided to dig a tunnel from the river cut far below. As Ricardo dug down, we dug horizontally in. No one actually said it out loud, but we were racing to the tomb. And Sadat was right. We made it to the tomb of Yashkukmo first. There were tens of thousands of artifacts. National Geo showed up to document it. It was a really big deal. I never spoke to Ricardo about it, but I bet you he was pissed. As for racing criminals to the artifacts... The hard truth is that archaeologists don't race them. We train them. Typically, we hire local people to dig for us. We train them, show them what we're looking for and how to find it. 
Then after the project is over, we leave and some of our now laid off staff, not most, but some, take their new skills and go pot hunting. An important side note here. In most cases, I don't really blame the looters. They wouldn't be doing it if there wasn't a black market to sell their finds on. Usually, they're the descendants of the culture they're looting. If they could ask their great-great-grandfather for a pot to keep their children fed, I'm sure they'd say yes. It's the black market vendors who buy it for hundreds and then sell it for thousands who I blame. Anyhow... Moving on to the related myth number seven. Archaeologists trash the sites they find. I love Indiana Jones, but he is a human wrecking ball. In the first ten minutes of the first movie, he totally destroys a South American cave shrine. He goes on to helping burn down Marion's bar, destroying an Egyptian temple, and ripping mummies from their chambers. In the third movie... He destroys catacombs under the Vatican, uses human bones as a torch, burns down a German castle, and then triggers the destruction of the Shrine of the Holy Grail. Then in the fourth movie, just to note two of his crimes, he defiles mummies in a Nazca tomb and destroys a Maya temple in the middle of the Amazon. In this regard, Jones is really a psychopath, with no respect for the ruins or the sanctity of the dead. So in reality, do archaeologists destroy sites? Well, um, not lately. I mean, there was that time when Schliemann dynamited Troy. Or when Batres blew the top off Teotihuacan's Pyramid of the Moon. Or when University of Pennsylvania ripped down an entire pyramid in Tikal. But today, we really are trying to be more careful. My personal opinion is that archaeology, by its nature, is a destructive process. And we should exhaust all possible avenues of surface study before a single shovel hits the dirt. But I digress. On to myth number eight. The whip and the hat. Indy looks really cool with his fedora and whip, and don't forget about that leather jacket. But are those really practical? Maybe in a desert environment like Egypt, but definitely not in the jungle. First, the whip. In reality, the machete is the tool of choice. We cut tunnels through thick vegetation. Trying to use a whip there would just pull thorny vines down on the backs of our necks. And the fedora? The jungle is humid, funky, and sweaty. Fedoras get gross and covered with green mold almost instantly. My family gave me a fedora before my first project in Belize, and I had to throw it out in less than a week. Baseball caps or bandanas, something you can wash and hang dry. That's reality's headgear. Okay, here's a weird one. Myth number nine. Archaeologists involve children in their work. Indy often involves children in his work, and in very irresponsible ways. When Jones is surrounded by Nazis in an Egyptian bar, Sala sends a group of children to surround him. Using children as human shields? Not cool, Indy. Or how about Short Round? Did that kid even have a real name? Indy taught him to gamble and steal and drive a car with blocks on his feet. And did Indy adopt him? As far as we know, he left him in India. And how about those children he and Mutt beat the crap out of in the Nazca graveyard? Those kids were clearly disturbed. They needed therapy, not a beatdown. And for that matter, how old is Mutt? Should Indy have brought him to Peru? But let's do the reality check. Have I ever hired children? Well, I must admit, yes. One of my machete guys in Palenque was 13 when I hired him, Manuel Lopez. But in my defense, he was a badass. In the first week, I watched him throw his machete end over end 15 feet and pin a venomous snake to the ground. Right there and then I said, that kid is with me. And I've kept up with him. Now, 20 years later, 
He lives in the village of Naranjo and has four kids of his own. There was also a kid in the ruins of Wachaktun who I hired to take photos at dawn and document solar alignments. He took a bunch of photos of his thumb and then got my camera stolen. I guess I got what I deserved on that one. Okay, a final commercial break, and when I return, we'll talk about Jones's archaeological field methods. Hey folks, I hope that most of you know by now that I've published a Maya Calendar iPhone app. But now I'm happy to announce that I've added a fun new feature, the ability to email friends their Maya birth date and associated horoscope. The Maya believe that your birth date shapes your personality and destiny, and my app was already showing you that. But now you can plug in a friend's birthday and email and for a small fee, send them their own digital copy. It's a great little birthday gift, or you could just send it for fun. You can find the app on the Apple App Store as Maya Calendar by me, Edwin Barnhart. Check it out. Hey, I'm back. This last section will be a kind of catch-all, but mostly about methodology. Myth number 10. Archaeologists can tell you where and when an artifact is from just by looking at it. Jones's encyclopedic knowledge lets him know where and when any artifact is from. The truth is that the vast majority of artifacts are potsherds and chunks of rock. Without what we call diagnostic features, we have no idea what they are, much less where they came from. If an artifact is made of a perishable material like wood or textile, we can try to date it with carbon-14 analysis. But even that is only accurate to plus or minus 50 years at best. And that technique was developed in 1952. All but the fourth Indiana Jones movie took place in the 1930s. Back then, the only way to date objects was through stratigraphic levels in controlled excavations or major changes in technology or ceramic styles. Even then, it was relative, not absolute dating. By that I mean you could say if an object was older or younger than another artifact, but not exactly when it was made. Now we have carbon-14 and a bunch of other dating techniques, but back in the 1930s, archaeologists were, frankly, flat-out wrong about a number of things. I'm not saying that we're not still wrong, we're just less wrong than they were. And all the time, people send me pictures of things they dug up or their grandfather got on a trip somewhere, and they expect me to be able to tell them when and where that object's from. Most of the time... There's just not enough there for me to see. So this idea that archaeologists can just tell you where an object is from because they take a look at it outside of context, well, that's movie. Okay, myth number 11. Archaeologists just dig willy-nilly until they find something. The few times we see Indy actually digging something up He's just throwing shovel loads of dirt over his shoulder. Or worse, he's just ripping into a mummy bundle. So no, this one in particular is very false. Now, and even back in the 1930s, archaeologists do controlled excavations involving laying out grids and slowly digging down in each, layer by layer, even recording when they find nothing. We're also responsible for cleaning up. At minimum, we backfill the holes we dig. If we excavate buildings, we're responsible for their consolidation, repair, and preservation. Oftentimes, a project spends more on consolidation than it does excavation. Myth number 12. Archaeologists keep the artifacts. Indy seems to have some blanket authority to obtain artifacts and do what he pleases with them. And... Sometimes he keeps them for himself. In the very opening of the first movie, he's taking a golden head out of a Chachapoyan waka. 
He's not recovering it from looters. He is the looter. And then another archaeologist steals it from him. The opening of movie number two is worse. Jones is in a fancy Shanghai nightclub trading the ashes of the Manchu dynasty's first emperor for a diamond. Then in the third movie at the start, he goes back and forth with thieves stealing the cross of Coronado. When he finally gets it, he gives it to Brody, who says in a creepy voice, This will find a place of honor in our Spanish collection. To which Indy responds, We'll discuss my honorarium over dinner and champagne tonight. Your treat. Did Indy just let a boatload of people die so he could sell an artifact? How about when he starts to pocket the knife out of Oriana's mummy bundle? Mutt looks at him disapprovingly until Indy puts it back. The thug had better morals than Indy. I also took a moment to freeze frame scenes from Indy's house in Princeton. And you guessed it, it's full of artifacts on the shelves and walls. Today, this rarely happens. There are laws that prevent artifacts from leaving their countries of origin and stiff penalties for stealing them. But then again, in Jones's defense, archaeologists of the early 1900s were in fact taking artifacts out of their countries and selling them. I already explained how Max Ule sold artifacts, but if we expand our eye to just the procurement for museums, then the list grows to include the finest institutions in the world. The Smithsonian, Harvard, Yale, University of Pennsylvania, especially the British Museum, and many others had archaeologists looking for things to fill their collection halls. And most of them still won't give them back. But that's another podcast, one that's too negative for me to voice. So, onward to the 13th and final myth. Why 13? Because I'm a weirdo Maya numerologist, that's why. Anyhow, this one is about Indiana Jones's signature tagline, That belongs in a museum. Let's put aside the unsavory fact that he sold them to museums like his enemies sold them to the Nazis. Do all artifacts really belong in museums? My incredibly unpopular opinion is no, not really. The truth is that we have an artifact crisis, and it's getting worse all the time. We have millions and millions of artifacts and nowhere to properly store them. Most of them aren't pretty to look at. They're potsherds, fragments of sculptures, deteriorated pieces of bone, and things like that. But even the really nice pieces, like complete ceramics or stone sculptures, or well-preserved perishable materials, we just have way more than we can responsibly curate, much less display. Every museum in the world is packed with more than it displays. And the things in their basements and storerooms, eh, they're suffering. They simply don't have the financial resources to properly preserve the things they own. It's not their fault, it's just the reality of the situation. Especially perishable artifacts, things that are made of wood, textile, feathers, etc. Those are rotting and deteriorating. In the oldest institutions, like the Smithsonian and the Peabody, there are objects that haven't been looked at there in over a hundred years. When I was a student in CU Boulder, I had a work study with the museum on campus. My job was to replace the paper tags identifying objects collected in the early 1900s. They weren't on acid-free paper, so they were all deteriorating or already gone. My job was to research each object and rediscover what it was. The attic was full of beautiful Anasazi pottery. Every one of the pieces had an illegible tag. I spent six months figuring out what each piece was and reprinting its tag on acid-free paper. That was 35 years ago, and the entire collection is still in the attic. I'd be surprised if over 50 people have seen it since. The truth is that any of those pieces would be better off in the hands of a collector. They have the money to properly curate it, and they show it off to every person who ever comes into their home. 
Am I saying that I approve of private collections? No. But do I believe going to a museum is good for most artifacts? Also, no. I wish that collectors and museums could work together, combining funding with responsible curation and public access. But that is another incredibly unpopular opinion of mine. So, to wrap up this episode, we'll go back to my initial question. Am I like Indiana Jones? I hope not, because in a lot of ways, that guy is an irresponsible jerk. But still, I love what I loved about him when I was 13. He's a fearless adventurer, nerd in the university, hero in the field. I don't know if I'll ever be all that, but admittedly, I aspire to be. Man, it's a good thing I don't have a university position, because this podcast episode, especially the last couple of things I said, would get me fired. But no one can fire me. I work for myself. There's no strings on me. So I'll just keep talking like this. Until next month, this is Ed, signing off. You've been listening to Archeo Ed, a podcast written, produced, and distributed by me, Ed Barnhart. If you liked what you heard, then subscribe, like, share, comment, and do all those other things that I'm supposed to ask you to do. If you didn't, then don't do any of that stuff. And if you really liked it, support ArcheoEd through my Patreon account. I make these podcasts for free, but I am not opposed to financial support. Until next time, thanks for listening. All rights reserved. Copyright 2020.